everyone on Zoom and in person. I really appreciate being here. I have put together um, a talk on environmental storytelling for stormy times. I know a lot of people are interested in telling the story of what's happening to the earth, whether you are a science major or a liberal arts major or, or what field you're going into, it's really important to be able to communicate this science. So I am starting with this strange slide of a, um, this is a woodcut involving witchcraft from the, um, from medieval times. And I wanted to start with this because I wrote a book, I wrote a book about rain. I, I am rain's biographer, which is my favorite title that I have. And um, in, in writing a book about rain, I wrote about the great uh, pluvial times. This was a really, really rainy time during the Little Ice Age. And the Little Ice Age was this 500 year period of very extreme rains and storms. There were um, record rains, record freezes. Um, people lost crops and entire villages were shuttered. Um, starvation set in, empty bellies filled with paranoia. And many people became convinced that witches were conjuring these storms. So as frightening weather intensified, so too did witch hunts and witch trials and the execution of thousands of victims accused as witches, many of them women. So this was just a crazy story um, that happened during the Ice Age. There's a fascinating German historian named um, Wolfgang Beringer who, who studies the witchcraft trials of that time and he has found a really interesting correlation between extreme weather and the rise of the witch trials. So I start by telling you that story to make a point that I'm going to make in this talk um, in the next hour and that is that you you want to try to find the human drama in the data. So, you know, a lot of you may have learned about the Little Ice Age or seen graphics about it or seen data points. And um, a good way to draw people into stories of what's happening to the Earth and the impact of things like climate and weather is to find those really fascinating human stories. So that is what I try to do in my work. Um, so this work of, of telling the story of the environment it is not new. It really goes back to the very beginning of, of writing, back to the history of Gilgamesh. I'll start by telling you about this fellow. Um, he is the English writer John Evelyn, and in 1661 he publishes the earliest known work on air pollution, and it was called Fuma Fugium. Um, the inconvenience of the air and smoke of London dissipated together with some rem remedies humbly proposed. Um, this is during the, during the rise of the Industrial Revolution. Um, there's this choking black air hanging over London. You may have read about this. Um, these times, if you've read Dickens, Dickens was one of the best uh, people writing and reporting on just the, the horrible conditions for people who worked in factories and people who lived um, among some of the worst, really terrible air, air pollution in the world. And what's kind of fascinating about this really early tract um, was that he breaks it down into three parts. The problem, the proposed solution, and the way of um, improving air quality. So he proposed that London replace industry with plantations of sweet smelling flowers and vegetation and to move the industry elsewhere. Um, of course, that is what eventually happened is that the industry was moved out. Um, but of course, London didn't become flowery uh, meadows, but it became the place where, where people lived in the inner city. So, um, Moving to the United States, uh, has anyone, have you been to 
Yellowstone, or has anyone in the online audience been to Yellowstone? A really incredible natural asset of the United States and um, really saved with the help of the photographs of William Henry Jackson and the paintings of Thomas Moran. Um, those photographs and artworks were really key to Yellowstone becoming the first national park in the 1870s. So back then, most Americans were living along the eastern seaboard and they actually did not believe these fantastical stories of prismatic springs and erupting hot geysers coming back um, from the frontier. And so these descriptions at the time were considered fantastical uh, exaggerations, and it sort of took Moran and Jackson, Jackson to show Americans what they couldn't see, so they would um, they would publish in, in magazines such as The Century to show that these, these amazing things really are happening out there in the West. So the point is that um, data and science are sort of never enough to help people understand the world around them and more crucially to help them see the connections between themselves and the wider world so we've always it's always taken environmental what we would today call environmental storytellers to be able to make those connections um, some of that is connections with the animal world of course this is coco the gorilla who has appeared on the cover of National Geographic twice, once in 1978 and again in 1985. The first image of Coco taking her own self-portrait in the mirror, and later the fo photo of Coco with her beloved kitten, really forever changed the perceptions that we have about the plight of gorillas. And to me, this is very much a changing, it's a major, a, a matter of changing the public ethos. There was a time when people, unlike now, really didn't have a soft heart or an open heart for gorillas, um, much less other, uh, f other fellow animals. And, and today we really do, and a big part of that has been um, again, the, the progression of environmental storytelling over time. You all might be more familiar with the story of Tilikum, a performing orca that killed several people while in captivity and became the subject of a documentary called Blackfish. Even though all the same facts about captive marine animals had been out there for many years, the storytelling in this film was so powerful that it collapsed SeaWorld stock by 60% when the film came out. And under financial and public pressure, SeaWorld announced that it would officially end its orca breeding program and end orca shows at its parks. So that really gives you a sense of um, the power that can be achieved with the environmental storytelling, and that could be anything from, from social media to documentary. Social media was a really important part of what happened to the um, to SeaWorld when the Blackfish film came out. Um, this is known as the Blackfish effect now. Um, the power of social media and its ability to um, to recreate itself online, people began to tackle this same story themselves online. And so people who didn't have anything to do with the making of the film or even the marketing of the film ended up creating their own social media cards and they were able to share the story of what was happening um, to killer whales even more broadly than the film itself could do. So this was like a one-off um, that really made a big difference. So this is the power um, that I think this generation has at your, at your fingertips. And th this, what I'm showing now is, is an example of the kind of social media cards that got shared all over at that time. Um, and they were kind of making fun of SeaWorld ads. SeaWorld ads said, SeaWorld recognizes the important bond between mother and calf 
And then some of the activists would use their own share cards against them by adding um, things like this. They put the little arrows and pointed out that the mother had been held at SeaWorld in San Antonio, Texas, and the, and the child had been moved to Spain um, before age four. So these are the kinds of things that are making a difference, but they all, they all go back to these same fundamentals um, that John Evelyn started with 500 years ago and that Rachel Carson was also practicing a half a century ago in what was probably the best known um, example of this type of influential work. And that was, of course, Silent Spring. Um, Silent Spring really helped people see um, an environmental threat they didn't see before, in this case, the toxic pollution that were killing birds and other animal life. And this is a really important time to remember because this is a time when DDT and other pollutants were killing birds and other, um, other life all over the world. Bald eagles, for example, were nearly wiped out. The, the bald eagle nests in the United States had fallen to fewer than 500 nesting pairs. They had been 500,000 um, at European settlement. And so all of these birds were imperiled and dying. Um, you know, it was a time of terrible industrial pollution in the United States. Rivers were catching fire. Um, the Hudson River here that you are so close to was really, really um, putridly polluted. And this is an extraordinary moment um, after Silent Spring and particularly 10 years later when the United States passed the Clean Water Act. Um, it's this extraordinary moment when people um, stop accepting that industrial pollution is an inevitable consequence of progress. So that's what, you know, that's what people were told, that we have to put up with this pollution as an inevitable consequence of our economic well-being. That wasn't true then, and it's not true now. And it's a matter of changing the public ethos so that people understand that. And um, it's about really helping people see a different way to live. So I think the brilliance of Carson, one of the brilliant things about Carson and Silent Spring was her last chapter, which was called The Other Road. And what she did so well, she exposed all those problems, but like John Evelyn and his solution for the, for the black smoke of London, she also held up the alternate future that could be. And that's what's really important about this work. So she said, the road we have long been traveling is deceptively easy, a smooth superhighway on which we progress with great speed, but at its end lies disaster. The other fork of the road, the one less traveled by, offers our last, our only chance to reach a destination that assures the preservation of our earth. And she really, um, she really showed us those two paths. And at least at that time, for, for a while, for, for a couple of decades, the country really turned around and began to um, take very bold action on behalf of, of the earth and, and life. We passed the Clean Water Act, created EPA, the Clean Air Act, a, a lot of really big things happened in that decade. And now I think um, we can, of course, argue that the pendulum has swung in the other direction. So um, we still, the environmental storytellers, are still very much um, important to this process of helping people see how, can, how we can live better and how we can change our current fortunes. And so I was going to introduce you to a couple of my students. I also, um, in addition to being an environmental journalist, I also teach environmental journalism. So I'm going to introduce you to a couple of students because I promise to um, 
give you some information about what kind of careers are available for environmental storytelling. So this is a student named um, Gabby Esiveri who graduated a few years ago. She is managing social media for the National Park Service. So on the left, you can see her plunged in uh, Big Cypress National Preserve. And on the right, she is at uh, Glacier National Park um, in Montana, where she'll be working this summer. And um, I'm always asking people like Gabby, who are successful in the profession, what skills are most needed? And they routinely say that the most important skill is the ability to tell stories. So you can easily learn whatever the latest platform is, whatever the social media is, but the real skill to acquire is the skill of being able to tell stories and really to hook your audience. So that's what I'll spend most of the time on today. Um, she said to succeed at the National Park Service, she has also has to know how to write well, compose photographs, create video, record and edit audio for podcasts, and create strong social media posts. So um, now I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you another student and I might get in trouble for showing you this student, um, but I have a, no, a number of students who have been drawn to climate change and justice activism. And this is a former student named Danielle Chanzis who gave me permission to share with you her mugshot, which is on the right. So in her young, in her young life, she has already been arrested twice um, for her work on justice. And her work as an activist also involves telling stories. In her case, she is often telling stories of incarcerated people because she works on justice and um, prison issues. And some of you may know, um, for example, in Florida, where I am coming from, even though we we're facing um, extreme heat, we already face extreme heat and it's rising. Um, more than half of Florida prisons do not have any air conditioning. So there are just some extraordinary climate issues in the prison system and a lot of intersectionality in the climate issues and, and activism. So um, this is another example um, of work on climate change and justice issues that really involves the ability to tell a story well. So Danielle will, uh, will often choose individual people to tell stories about. Now more, more typical of my students are Joan Miners and Alex Harris on the right. Joan on the left um, has just been named the first climate storytelling position at the Arizona Republic. And this is an interesting thing we're seeing. Um, media platforms all over the country have been creating specific climate storytelling or climate reporting positions. So this is a pretty fast growing area of journalism. So the Washington Post recently announced that it was hiring 50 climate journalists. Um, the New York Times has been hiring climate journalists. It's a, very, um, it's a very hot field within the field of journalism. Alex Harris on the right was the first climate change reporter at the Miami Herald. And so of course she's, she's had to buy a pair of boots. She works a lot on the sea rise story. And in both Joan and Alex's cases, um, and in addition to be able, being able to tell a good story, um, they recommend that college students really get experience in data in databases. So learning databases, um, learning how to manage databases and work with databases and figure out how databases can tell stories is really important. So um, all of this is to say that this field is a really big tent in anything you're doing, whether you are a scientist or you wanna be a traditional mainstream journalist or you are an activist, the power of storytelling um, is really important for helping people understand what's happening to the earth and its life. And also that, that other um, really big issue of being able to show them 
a different way of living. So, so in my own career, so I want to make clear that this is a big tent and there is a place for everyone. So it's sort of where your great passion meets the earth's greatest need, there is going to be a spot for you. And in my own career that sort of took place in the, in the world of books, um, I came at this from mainstream journalism, but I really um, always wanted to write books even when I was a kid. And I started out writing pretty much about water and sort of um, maybe a little bit wonkier books in my first two books. And then over time, I really came to understand that um, people want to be drawn in by human stories. So they want more than the policy and the investigative reporting. They really want those human stories like that crazy witchcraft story I shared with you when we started. So um, in my third book, um, sometimes the way I think about my body of work is that I've covered the whole hydrological cycle from freshwater to rain and then to the ocean. So in my book, Rain, I sort of shifted more from pipelines to poetry. I write about the poetry of rain and the scent of rain. And again, those human stories that really draw people in. My new book is a natural and cultural history of seashells ostensibly, um, but it's really ultimately at its heart a, a story about climate change and what's happening to the, to the earth. So um, again, there is a place for each one of us, and I think that the important thing in college is to find that um, sweet spot where, again, your, your talents meet the needs of the world. And there are so many different needs along that spectrum from activism to mainstream journalism or anywhere in between, anywhere you want to find yourself, you will benefit from, from these tools. So these are just, um, I put together the fundamental things to remember for telling the stories um, of the environment. There, know your audience, enter their world with respect, the power of listening, how to find touchstones, telling narrative stories, the power of metaphor, how to use emotion, and then being sure to leave your audience with solutions or some kind of call to action. Don't, you don't ever want to leave them with nothing to do. So I'm just going to go through these uh, briefly. The first is on knowing your audience. I think there is a, there's a bit of a fallacy that there's this big um, sheep-like general audience, that if we could only tap that general audience, we could change the world. That's not actually true. There are just many fragmented audiences, and your work is to figure out what audience you want to speak to or draw into your story. So one, one important thing on, in terms of climate change communication is knowing how, you know, what people know about global warming and how, how alarmed they are. And one, um, one group I spend a lot of time looking at is uh, the, the climate change communication program at Yale and the Center for Climate Change Communication at George Mason University, they come out with this regular survey on global warming six Americas, and it basically asks America, Americans, um, how alarmed or concerned are you about climate change? And this is what it looks like now. Um, more, well over half of Americans now are concerned about climate change, concerned or alarmed. And the great thing about looking at this every time it comes out over years, which I do, is the extent to which those um, percentages have changed over time. It's a really big difference, in fact, over time. Um, this, is, this is where you can see the difference in concern that's growing over time. Um, the percentage of Americans that are dismissive, doubtful, or disengaged is getting much, much smaller over time. 
and the percentage of Americans who are, who are concerned or alarmed is growing a lot. And the alarmed is the category growing the most, of course, and that has to do in part with the extent to which we are being impacted in our homes by climate change, whether it would be flooding here in the city or wildfires in the West. So it's good to know um, how much your audience already knows or how concerned they are about climate change. And, and my advice is to completely ignore, you can ignore the dismissive and the doubtful. They are very loud, but they are not um, the majority of people. So they're kind of a small and loud group. And the place where you can make the most difference in moving the needle is in the middle. So either in the cautious or in the concerned, those are the people for whom the, the needle has been moved. Um, okay, the next fundamental is to enter their world with respect. So again, entering the world of your audience. Um, some of you may recognize the climate scientist, Catherine Hayhoe of Texas. She's an evangelical Christian who is a climate scientist. And she's really great at talking with conservative people um, and churches and so on about climate change and helping them understand um, what, she, what she sees as a Christian obligation to care for the earth and to save the earth and its people. So she, has, she tells this great story of one time she was going to speak at a small rotary club in a rural area of Texas and she had her she had her PowerPoint already and she had all her statistics about carbon emissions and all of those things and she went um, she went to give her presentation and when she sat down she looked up and she saw um, the flag that was flying at the Rotary Club where they um, they have a four-way test that's very important to them um, and it's something they talk about in their meetings and it's part of their ethos. So as she sat there, as they were eating lunch, she opened her PowerPoint and she redid it really fast. And she redid the whole PowerPoint based on the four, the four way test of the Rotary Club. Rotarians are supposed to ask themselves these questions. And if all four of these answers are true, then that is something they should be involved in. So she redid her whole presentation about climate change to this Rotary Club in their own language. And that's what that means to enter their world in a really respectful way. And lo and behold, this, this Rotary Club took on, took on climate change um, as, as a local project. And um, these, these, are the kinds of, these are the kinds of ways in um, another one is the power of listening. Um, one thing that is clear to anyone paying attention to the way history has been mistold, everything from human history to environmental history, um, you, you really see the extent to which um, we have listened to perhaps the wrong people, you know, even, even sometimes listening to so-called experts are not the real experts. And I'll give you an example. This is the Yurok Reservation in the Klamath Mountains of Northern California. Um, the people of this area had been doing controlled burns and managing their forests for hundreds of years before um, European settlement and many, many other tribes in the West as well. They really knew how to take care of forests. They did a good job of forest management. Um, they did controlled burns and other kinds of forest management over centuries. Uh, a, a, some, you know, obviously the climate uh, wildfire emergency in the American West is partially caused by the warming of the earth, but it's also um, it's also harmed by the way we manage forests and the way people build in the path of, of these fires. And so forest managers now and wildfire officials now have gone back to listening to, to native people. And this is happening in a lot of different parts of the American West. And it's, a, it's just a reminder 
One, that we have to rethink the idea of who the expert is. Um, you know, the, the educated expert and the engineer and so on has their place at the expert table, but so too do indigenous people and local people who live in that community. You know, if it's a fishing issue, an expert would certainly be a fisher who's been fishing in that water body for a long time. So this is this idea of listening is really a way of thinking about um, who, who is contributing the important information? And it's really a much broader, it's really a much broader table than we have, than we have been open to in the past. So my most recent book, as I mentioned, is ostensibly about seashells, but it's fundamentally built around that metaphor of listening. So we'll talk about metaphor itself in a minute, but this idea of listening applies to nature. It applies listening to nature, listening to science, listening to indigenous wisdom, to people of color, to women who have been left out of the science narrative and, and so on. The next, um, oh, these are some tips about listening to community. Uh, I was mentioning to some of you earlier that I have a few students this semester in Narragansett, Rhode Island, who are working on climate change stories, sea rise stories and resilience stories. And um, we have been going over some tips for listening in communities. So a really important thing in environmental storytelling is to really immerse yourself in that human community and understand it. And so um, we talked, for example, about walking around a place you've never been without your earbuds in. So you're really hearing the sounds of the community and, and truly listening. So again, it's knowing your audience, um, it's trying to create a space of listening at least as much as you talk. Um, listening by fully centering that person and their experience. Um, making sure you know the history of a place, including the environmental history. And um, feeling okay with silence. Uh, this is something we teach in journalism school that I think other people would benefit from too. But if you're talking and asking questions of someone and there's a silence, sometimes that might feel awkward to you and you want to jump in and fill that space, but you don't need to do that. It's kind of nice to allow a little bit of silence. And you find often that the other person is just thinking about something or you know needs to needs to have a memory come to them and it's sort of nice to leave a silent space and and open that space up for the honest statement or nugget or insight you were waiting for so the next fundamental is to find touchstones and i just am giving you an example here from the seashell book um, despite what you hear from the cryptocurrency world, the first global money was not cryptocurrency. It was a tiny white shell called a cowrie shell. Um, it's also known as the money cowrie. And as I mentioned in this, in this new book, I built it around iconic human seashells. So each chapter is a different seashell, which was very important to humanity but which also tells some really important story for where we are now. And one of those was the cowries. So in summer 2019, I traveled to the Maldives where the money cowries were harvested and then on to West Africa to follow the route of this first global money. And um, the living animals too, it's just fascinating to me that the very thing that was money and these shells served as money longer than any paper money or coin in human history and it's fascinating that they're made by these squishy little animals but beyond that um, the really the really devastating part of the cowrie money story is that cowries purchased an estimated third of the enslaved africans forced to the americas and that story tells what i feel is the book's most important meditation which is that we won't be able to fix environmental problems without also writing human injustices. So you can see how you could take something really small, 
like one shell and tell a bigger story about justice or a bigger story about what's happening to the environment. And in fact, a really small thing is often a really good way to tell a big story. And that's the idea behind looking for touchstones. The other fun, a really big fundamental is to tell narrative stories. And that's kind of what I've been talking about all along. But um, just this idea that it's humanity over data. And, and if you're wondering what the story is, sometimes I literally say to myself, when I'm trying to think of what my story is, sometimes I'll be at my laptop and I'll literally say to myself, okay, once upon a time, because that will make me remember, well, how would it, you know, how would a children's story have told that? Um, or, you know, what is the hook that will draw people in? So it's the stories you know um, from the Bible, for example, Noah, um, Noah's flood is, is perhaps the most well-known flood story, but those kinds of flood stories are repeated all through ancient texts, starting with Gilgamesh. And they're very, it's very sticky to tell a narrative story. It really, really stays with people. Um, another thing I love, um, in terms of, in terms of some of the flood stories, in the Rain Book, I wrote a lot about the Mississippi River flood of 1927 and the blues music that, that came out of that flood. If you listen to blues music, there's an incredible amount of environmental storytelling in blues music, and a lot of it is associated with the 1927 Mississippi River flood, where a lot of early blues songs were coming out of that era. So just imagine, um, I didn't bring any audio, but just imagine some of those poignant blues songs and you can kind of mix those. I think the sweet spot is finding these human stories and then putting those together with the hard hitting data. So it's not just, the fever chart is important, um, but you can't just use the fever chart. I think it's the combination of the, you know, the really epic human story mixed with the fever chart and what's happening um, to water or to the climate or to whatever your story is. Um, and another thing I wanted to mention is the power of metaphor. In these, in these three panels, I am showing you um, three different images of the tree of life. So the tree of life has been maybe one of the most important environmental metaphors of all time. Darwin famously used it as a simple tree of relationships among species. But another beautiful thing about it is just you know, how it touches people across cultures as a metaphor. So the Assyrians had their sacred tree of life, which is depicted on the far left. There's a, a tr cr Christian tradition of the tree of life in Genesis, um, and another that symbolizes the death and resurrection of Jesus. So when you think about, when you think about um, things that pull people in, metaphor, is very powerful for that. And that's, that's another reason I was drawn to seashells and to storms and to water. All of these elements are really metaphoric, again, in ways that a fever chart or are not. Um, the next one is to use emotion. So it's good to use emotion, but you wanna use emotion with intention. So, um, Intergenerational emotion works well anytime you put together a, a father and child or a grandmother and a grandbaby. That is a very powerful and moving thing um, when, you're, when you're talking about climate change and water and other resources and the future viability of the earth. These are some things that don't work as well. So we know, for example, and there's been a lot of research done on all of this. We know, for example, that the polar bear was not, you know, people who were using the polar bear to try to help the public understand what's happening with climate change. Um, the, the polar bear is very appealing for those of us who already care about animals and the environment, but for people who are not there yet, 
They just don't feel drawn in by the polar bear the way they would by perhaps a father and baby, right? And then some of these other things are just weird attempts at climate communication over time. Um, the one on the left, the fish head, I'm not really sure what that was doing. I guess it was claiming that we were going to go back to being fishes again. And then this one, um, it, can be, it can be frustrating to see climate communication that is all based on your personal responsibility because these are really systematic issues that have to be changed. And so um, to the extent, it's, it's great to help people understand um, how what a big difference we can make if we collectively don't use bottled water or whatever it is. But the really important change is systematic change. So to the extent that we can, um, it's great to try to tell stories that will help people see the systematic change that's possible. So other really good points of emotion are awe, like scientific wonder is really a good way to draw people in. Um, humor, humor works. And hope, hope is a really big one. And I don't mean Pollyannish hope, like everything's going to be fine. I mean, really, you know, rolled up sleeves hope, um, sort of, you might think of it as working hope, um, that, that together there is a lot we can do. Um, then you may have seen this before, but these are kind of the fundamentals for telling the story of climate change. And again, this is based on research um, about what works. If you remember nothing else, kind of the five things to hit anytime you're telling the story of climate change, scientists agree. That's really important, the extent of scientific agreement on this. It's not like you can go out and tell a two-sided story. Some people say it's getting warmer and some people don't. Scientists absolutely agree. It's real, it's us, it's bad, but there's hope. So those are the kind of five, five things to remember. Um, the, the last one, and this is so important, is to always have a solution or a call to action. You don't want to just go out there communicating and not know what you're asking people to do because it, it's not effective. You will expend a lot of your creative energy and it won't go anywhere. So you also, you always want to think to yourself, what is my ask? What am I asking people to do? What do I want them to know? So um, a really good, a really good um, source for this is Project Drawdown, which you might be familiar with, but it's a great website that is, and a book, um, all built on climate solutions. And these are climate solutions that have been analyzed for the impact that they'll have for the, um, if, you know, for the impact they'll have on lowering emissions and so on. And some really interesting things about that are the things that you may not think of as directly connected to lowering carbon emissions, but they are connected to that over time. And that includes the education of girls. There's been a lot of research on this to the extent, the extent to which we can keep girls in school around the world um, we know that girls who stay in school have fewer children overall. They have children later in life. Um, they, um, they are able to bring more income into their communities. There is just such a long list of ways educating girls actually helps climate resilience. So no matter what solution it is or what um, call to action that you want to focus on, it's just really important to have something to give people, um, to, to have an action that they can take. So those again are, are the fundamentals and um, I guess I would, I would end by, I would end by going back to, to Rachel Carson and the other road, which was the name of the last chapter in Silent Spring. I think our work is to show people what's possible and that other, that other road ahead. And I think with environmental storytelling, we can do so with a lot of humanity and, and respect for our audiences and people and, and nature. So 
Thank you. Here's a couple of resources that you can check out and my contact information, and I'd be happy to share um, all of this on email as well, but these are a couple of sources um, that I've used today and that I go to frequently. And uh, here, here in the city, N NYU has this great series called the Kavli Conversations on science communication. And if you can't go in person, you can go online. And they're all, they're all archived on the website. So you can go in here. I think the latest one was about scientific illustration and how to use illustration to tell science and climate stories. And that was really cool. So um, that's all I have for you. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. I don't know if any questions came up in the chat or if you have a question here, thank you. Cynthia, I have a question for you. Yes. Um, when you talk about these wonder, you know, this is a wonderful approach to telling a really hard story. How do you commun get through what could be sort of the shutdown that people might uh -huh. feel about climate change, like the latest IPCC report? It's very frightening and yeah. overwhelming. Are yeah. there techniques that you suggest to work around that kind of overwhelm? Yeah, I, I think that's a really important question. And again, I think there are a lot of different ways and different, also different personalities for how to be a storyteller. So there are plenty of gloom and doom storytellers and they write books and people love their books. And they have a particular audience of people who are looking for that. They wanna know how bad it's gonna be. So that is a particular audience. But as you say, and the science backs this up too, we know that if people are drowned in too much negative information, that they will shut down and they will stop reading a story. There's even, it's called eye track research where um, communications researchers watch people's eyes when they get to different point, points in a story online and they can see in their eyeballs that their eyes stop reading when they get to information that's either too dense or too doomsday oriented. And I think the answer to that, I think the answer to that is to find these really human stories. And I don't, I don't propose that we not give them the information and the truth. I think all of those things are important, but they have to be woven in to a really, you know, it could be a beautiful human story, it could be a poignant story, and I think these stories are usually human, even when they're about the environment, even when they're about animals. People like to hear about other people, and that seems to be what works. Another thing I'll mention, um, just riffing off what you just said, and you, the audience may have heard this before, but there is a, there's a concept called, um, it's called the information deficit model of, client, climate, of science communication, right? For a long time, um, scientists operated as if, oh, if people only knew what I knew, if they only had the information I know, they would be smarter, they would change the way they live, they would do the right thing. So we know that's not true. It's not that people need more information, it's that they need those touchstones, they need that human connection, they need some touchstone to their own lives. So that's me trying to touch people with seashells, or it might be Catherine Hayhoe at the Rotary Club, uh, you know, giving her whole climate presentation around the four, um, four things that are most important to the Rotary Club. In every case, you have to find out what that audience wants. But I don't want that to sound like those reports aren't important or even, you know, I think even, you know, sounding the alarms and waving the red flags, that's all really important too. I think all of it is important. Yes. Um, 
Yeah, I do. Um, I'm trying to, if I could grab my phone, I could tell you some favorite podcasts. I'm going to do that. Oh, it might be. I think it's in my jacket pocket. So um, do you know Ayana Elizabeth Johnson? So if you if you search for her on your favorite podcast list, she has some great, um, really inspirational podcasts about particularly about women and climate. Um, And so that's a good one. And while it's not about storytelling per se, she's a very good storyteller and she gets good people on um, who are storytellers. So I, I would definitely recommend looking at her. Yeah. Does anybody else? Yes. 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 Yeah. 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 Shaping that narrative? Yeah. Um, it was, it, 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 the consequences have been devastating to the environmental movement. It has been one of the reasons why. So the question was about the fact that the environmental movement itself um, has been largely white, upper middle class, but also the storytellers of the environment, such as Aldo Leopold have tended to be um, white male of a certain um, certain socioeconomic status. So um, it's been really devastating to the environmental movement because it fragmented the environmental movement. And, you know, the pollution was so bad at mid-century that something had to happen. It was very visible. Rivers were catching fire. Um, you know, the everything, all surface waters were pollu- polluted, huge fish kills. Um, there's that turning point where a lot happened, but then there was a lot of lost opportunity for, I would say, the next 30 or 40 years. And all of those years when the environmental community could have been in a coalition with the African American community, Native American people. Instead, there was this, um, there was kind of a famous split um, where NAACP and other leaders came forward, I think it was in the early 80s, and wrote letters to all the major environmental NGOs kind of complaining about the lack of any uh, board members of color and so on. And the environmental community really did not get its act together about this for maybe maybe until five years ago, I would say. I think this is finally being fixed, but it was a huge problem because it, it left the environmental community and story very splintered, very exclusive, and it also it also gets the story itself wrong. So the environmental movement isn't just about um, majestic, saving majestic places or particular birds. It's really, it really comes down to people and people who are vulnerable and everything that happens in communities. So I, I would say that that was, you know, probably the fundamental flaw of early environmentalism and early environmental storytelling. John, John Muir is probably the most famous example because in addition to, um, you know, Aldo Leopold, Aldo Leopold has a little bit of baggage, but John Muir um, is, is someone who, when you read his writing, he just writes very painfully about the African-Americans he comes across in his journeys. and and Native American people. And so I think he might be the poster child of the need to have the conversation and the need to fix this going forward. And I think these coalitions now um, are becoming stronger 
And the story is getting so much better as a result, right? You see a lot more stories now about Native American people and their, their role in the environment and other kinds of stories. So I think that's a really key question. Time for one more. Is there um, any question online? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So um, if you wouldn't, if you would be comfortable sharing, what are some of, so it's a two prong question. Yeah. What are some of the memorable conversations you've had as an environmental journalist and which environmental storytellers do you look to for inspiration and would recommend to aspiring writers? So, um, I'll tell you an inch, this is just a quirky conversation that comes to mind. I, I have a lot of conversation with scientists and with community members and people I interview, but one of my most memorable conversation, some of my most memorable, memorable conversations are those I have as a book author who goes out and talks about my books in communities. And so one reason, one strategy behind the seashell book is that I will be able to go out and talk to all kinds of people about shells, but, but really about the ocean, about climate change, all of the things in my, in my talk that I give in other places. And I was invited to speak at a yacht club and there were very, you know, this one fellow, this one fellow there, he was a billionaire and he was a climate denier and he, it was a very fancy place and most of the members of the Yacht Club were men and they were there with their wives and he really challenged me after my talk. He was, you know, telling me that um, the science was wrong and it was a conspiracy. They, they all have the same little pack of papers that they have from um, wherever they're getting them from and I, I just started answering his questions very um, calmly and, and started invoking some of the things I was talking about today, particularly our, our generational obligation to the future, to the future earth and to future generations of grandchildren. And I was talking about some of these things for some time and I could tell that the women in the room were with me. Like sometimes you can tell, um, not in times when people have masks on, but in other times you can tell when people are with you. And I could just tell in that moment that regardless of this fellow, the, the woman who was at the table beside him, his wife really understood what I was saying about future generations and, and also felt concerned. And you can kind of see when, when people are coming around and being engaged by your story. And that happened in that moment and it was a very good feeling and it just reminded me why I do what I do. Most often I don't want, I don't try to preach to the choir. I mean, I do, I do teach, but my work is not preaching to people who already feel the same way I do. I'm really trying to tap this other audience. It's an audience I think of called the caring, think of it as the caring middle. Like these are people who care once they understand. And I could see that all the women in the audience were, were really caring about what I said. And that was an important moment. And then um, the people I admire as uh, fellow environmental writers, there are so, there are so many of them. Um, you know, one, one definitely is um, Betsy Colbert, Elizabeth Colbert and her books are fantastic. I already mentioned um, Ayana Elizabeth Johnson is a really important podcaster who I would recommend to, to everyone. And um, there are some great, um, there's, a, there's a, a writer with a new book out. His name is David George Haskell. He is a, he is a biologist who wrote some beautiful books about trees, who now has a new book out all about earth sound and how earth sounds are being lost. And I thought that was a very beautiful way in to talk about um, some of the climate stories. So those are a few suggestions. Well, thank you for being here. Thank you to the online audience. And I look forward to our event this evening.